And <clears throat> so thanks everybody for coming out to our talk this afternoon about recipes, which I really consider to be the future of Drupal site building. For anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Martin Anderson Klitz. I work at Acquia as a senior solutions engineer, and I'm also on a podcast called Talking Drupal. Done a bunch of certifications around sort of Drupal and adjacent technologies, and on most uh, Drupal and social platforms, you can find me as Mancleo. More. <laughs> Uh, more recently, I was also named the uh, track lead for the events recipe within Drupal Starshot. And yes, as some of you may know, today is also my birthday. Yeah. Also, I want to give a big shout out to all of the awesome sponsors who made it possible for us all to be here to have conversations like this one and uh, really at no cost to us. So that's pretty awesome. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to talk about why recipes are useful, uh, some big news, what goes into a recipe, how you can apply them, some of the things that we're working on, and last but not least, we're going to get hands-on and, and actually get something cooking. So why was there a need to have this system that we're calling recipes? So for a long time, Drupal's had these distributions and install profiles as a way to sort of quickly add a set of capabilities to your website, but they always came with a set of problems. So the distributions themselves uh, can be difficult to keep updated. Uh, once you're, um, you have your site already created, you can't sort of retroactively go back and add a distribution to it. And you can't really sort of mix and match them. So a lot of times they're extremely opinionated. You couldn't say like, I'm gonna start with the Commerce Kickstart and then also the Red Hen Razor. It's like you sort of have to pick a lane and stick with it. And then the other problem is, if you're somebody who's new to Drupal, you might realize after you're halfway down the road of creating your site that these things exist and at that point it's too late. So the solution that we came up with is what we're calling recipes. It's so really a lightweight way to add configuration to your site. Um, they can install modules, but can't have any of their own code. Um, they're composable, so you can have recipes that call other recipes, which means you can have sort of very granular ones, but also maybe site recipes that will install a whole bunch of other recipes to you know, give you a really solid starting point. You um, apply a recipe to your Drupal site, you don't install it, because once you apply it, it basically you know, it goes back to being inactive. It's not a thing that you would say is active on your site, it's just it has put its configuration into your site architecture. Recipes are by design easy to share and don't lock you into a, any particular path. You can sort of rip out the configuration that a recipe had applied at any point. So the big news uh, from a little bit earlier this year is that phase one of the recipe roadmap is complete. So phase one was really about saying, let's have a system where we can actually take these recipes and apply them to our site. So that was released in Drupal 10.5, or sorry, 10.3. There were a few sort of um, enhancements as part of Drupal 11. Um, it is still officially an experimental API, and so I think we're going to continue to see uh, lots of enhancements in the coming months for recipes. So some of the things that we're in phase one, uh, really having a class in core that can you know, parse out this recipe.yaml and the composer file. Um, basically having the uh, have a recipe runner that will go through the different elements that are sort of part of that recipe. So primarily the uh, recipe.yaml file will get into the guts of, of what makes that up, but doing things like um, Installing other recipes, if that's called for, um, installing any other sort of um, modules or themes that might be called for, importing some of the configuration that's provided by those modules or themes, uh, potentially selectively or on more of a bulk basis, and then running what we call configuration actions, which are really a more flexible way to add configuration to your site. And potentially, most critically, also having an API so that Contrib modules or even custom modules can define their own config actions, which also makes it um, very expandable as well. So a quick timeline. You know, th this whole idea of recipes was really proposed about, uh, well, a little over two years ago in Portland 2022. 
Later that year, Alex Pott gave a demo of it in Drupal Hunt Prague, and then there was lots of work over the next two years around really building out the infrastructure for the entire recipe system. And this year, we've, we've seen a lot of progress in terms of things that we can actually now start to use. So uh, lots of progress around config validation. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the, uh, there's been a lot of work within the community around getting Drupal's install profiles converted over to recipes. So the first one was the standard profile, and then more recently, the minimal and umami profiles converted over. Um, there's also, you know, as we talked about, uh, phase two being complete and phase, um, phase one being complete, phase two beginning. And now uh, with Drupal 11's release, um, a variety of improvements and lots of traction actually right now on recipes in the um, issue queue there. So what goes into a recipe? Um, this is sort of a basic idea of the structure. So the recipe.yaml is really what does most of the heavy lifting. Composer.json is really the way to make sure that your site is going to have all of the dependencies. And then you can optionally have these config and content folders as a way to sort of import either static config uh, configuration files. Most often, they're probably going to be configuration entities that you're trying to create that way. And then content as a way to sort of make sure the content becomes automatically populated through your recipe. So here's an example. This is actually a Detroit project called Alerts. Uh, we're going to, uh, time allowing, give that a trial run later. So you can see we've got our composer file, our recipe file. We've got the config folder that has a bunch of files that were basically exported as part of Drupal standard configuration management. And then some content that's going to be imported by this recipe. And I'll just point out that within the content folder, the content is actually in a subdirectory uh, named to match its entity ID. So the composer.json file is going to be pretty similar to people who are used to poking around in sort of modules or themes. You know, most of the metadata is the same. The probably critical difference here is the type of Drupal recipe, which is something new, and then defining whatever your, you know, um, dependencies are in this case. Uh, a couple of other recipes as well as a Drupal module. The recipe.yaml file um, has a number of different components. Again, some similarities with like an info.yaml file that you may have seen already. Things, it's going to define things like the name and description. Uh, you can have an optional uh, type key, so that, that's going to, in things like the project browser, potentially allow for grouping things that, that are sort of common. And then anything you put under the recipes is going to automatically get applied before your recipe. The install is really for where you can specify <coughs> modules or themes that you want your recipe to install. But when it installs them, it's not going to install all of their configuration. It's only going to use what it calls like basic configuration, so kind of like what you would have on like a settings page or something like that. Uh, I would say, critically, the difference is it's not going to import any configuration entities that are provided by the default configuration for those modules. But what you can do is use this config import key within your recipe.yaml. And so you can see examples here of either providing a wildcard to say, bring in everything that's provided by that module, or you can selectively pick out specific ones that you want to make sure that the recipe will get imported. So the, um, to me, the, the most powerful part of recipes is this idea of configuration actions, because it's really where it becomes very, very flexible and gives you, as a recipe author, the ability to be very nuanced about how and when you're going to make certain changes to the, the site's configuration. A config action has really three main components. So you need to specify the uh, basically the ID of the configuration you want to manipulate. You have to declare what action to take and then provide some arguments and which arguments you need or which ones you can accept will really depend on a variety of factors including um, you know, which action it is that you're using, uh, whether you're using, for example, the uh, singular or the plural form of the config action and so on. There is also a config actions API, so this is an example of the code to actually define a config action. So you can see it's done by declaring a class, and then it's using a PHP attribute 
to provide the <clears throat> different elements to sort of define the metadata for that uh, configuration action. So in this case, you can see it's got an ID value here. It's actually in this case specifying uh, which entity types this config action can be used against because there are sort of fundamentally two, two different kinds of config actions. So anything that doesn't have a value for this entity types can be used globally on any kind of entity, but uh, some config actions are meant to only be used with specific ones, and that's where they'll have this entity types. So let's talk uh, first about some of the globally available ones. So there's a simple config update to basically set some kind of a value. Uh, create if not exists is a good one for uh, providing some configuration. But if a site already has configuration, to basically say, let's just leave it with what it has and not create any kind of an error. You can set components, sort of add something like a field to, let's say, an existing content type or a form. And then uh, things like create or third-party settings are sort of ways to um, add to the site in ways that sometimes are a little bit more nuanced. Set third-party setting is sometimes if you need to add like uh, filter configuration or, or some other things as well. But there's uh, a QR code here. I'm also going to make these uh, um, slides available at the end. There's going to be another QR code to get them all, and I'll have them posted probably to the GovCon website as well. So. Definitely available to um, go through much later. For the uh, config entity actions, the ones that are really specific to different kinds of config. Um, got a few examples here, but as you can see, there's many more. I think there's about 16 different ones that apply to a variety of uh, different kinds of config entities. So rent permissions as a way to say, we want to add a permission to certain roles. You can have you know, add note types or add taxonomy vocabularies to workflows to sort of programmatically say, um, say we're um, providing events as a new content type, we can also automatically add those to specific workflows. We can do things like, you know, add a field to all uh, bundles. So again, rather than having to sort of individually declare those as things that you want to add, and in a similar way, uh, you can use the add item to toolbar if you're providing some kind of a new filter as an example, or a new button to make sure that that gets added to uh, whichever editor that you need. And you can also do these in sort of broad strokes using these wildcards. So as an example here, you can see taking an action to say we want to add this particular permission to all available roles, or maybe we want to add this field to all available content types. It becomes a really powerful way to not have to be specific, not have to sort of repeat yourself in terms of, you know, manually um, doing the same sort of configuration change over and over or even having to, to anticipate. If it's something that you know should be applied sort of site-wide, uh, probably you'll see some of these in use with things like the SEO recipes that are currently in progress. So some best practices around using recipes, where at least I, I guess uh, developing them, there's this new concept of item potency, which is a word that I had probably literally not heard of until about a couple months ago. The idea of item potency is really that you can apply a recipe again and again to the same site and it shouldn't uh, create any errors. And um, that's important because of their composability, because you may have the same as an example, events recipe that is declared as a dependency for a number of other recipes, and because of item potency, it works both for sites that have that recipe already applied, but also ones that don't. And so item potency becomes uh, really important for the flexibility of it, but also adds a little bit of complexity in terms of how you're going to create your recipes. It, it's where the config actions really become important. I find that it's really helpful to keep them granular. It makes them a little more maintainable. It also means that people can sort of pick and choose the specific features that they need on their site. And finally, just go ahead and start publishing recipes that you want to share with the community. So you can publish them to anything that has packages integration. You know, GitHub, there's a variety available there already. Or you can go on to Drupal.org and create a general project and uh, it'll be available via Composer after that. So we already talked about how there's this ability to provide content within a recipe. Really that comes from a code that was 
brought into core from a contrib project called Defon Default Content. So the idea being that you provide a YAML file for each item of content that you want to have imported, and it will actually, when it applies that recipe, make sure that that content gets brought into your site. In terms of generating the YAML, uh, still best, uh, best practice is to use the default content uh, module, uh, so that's a good trick project. It'll do the export. Again, you'll notice as part of the folder that it creates that it has subfolders for each of the different entity types that you've asked it to generate, and you want to make sure that you keep that structure intact and put that into the content directory within your recipe. And then once that's in there, whenever you apply the recipe, it's going to validate that content, make sure that the structure of the YAML is uh, sound, and then it'll import that into the site that is applied to recipe. So here's an example of a recipe.yaml file. This, again, is a, a different uh, contrib recipe that you can go ahead and use on Drupal.org called locations. And so we can see we've got the metadata at the top. We've got uh, a variety of different sort of core and contrib projects that it's going to install when you apply this recipe. And then it's going to import the provided configuration for a number of those projects. Going further down, you can see with the config actions, it's taking an existing, in this case, form display and adding a variety of components to make sure that they apply and are going to appear in the correct order. So what does the process look like to apply recipes? So um, today, at least the way I've been using it most often, um, has been on the command line. Um, particularly the new version of Drush, Drush 13, has this Drush recipe command that makes it really super easy, and I find that's most often, um, for myself, the easiest way. I know there is recipe integration available in Project Browser now, but Al Project Browser is still alpha, so um, by all means, go ahead and try that out. Provide feedback to the Project Browser team based on how that works for you. Probably also useful to understand the order in which the recipe runner does all of these things. So it's going to start by applying any other recipes that you call for. After that, it's going to install modules or themes that you've uh, set in that sort of install key. And then it's going to import any specified configuration for those. Again, that idea of the config entities that aren't part of the simple config that's always imported. And then after that, it's going to import any uh, provided configuration you pro provide in the folder of your recipe. Following that, it's going to apply the configuration actions, and then as a last step, it's going to import the content that you've created. So there's been a lot of work this year. We already sort of mentioned briefly about turning the core. Oh, that's exciting. Let's try. Oh, we got it back. I'll try not to touch it. Um, so we already mentioned that there's been a lot of work in terms of turning those core install profiles into recipes, um, partly as a way to say we've got a, a set of functionality that we know we want to reproduce, and going through the exercise of turning those into recipes is going to give us a really good idea of the kinds of ways that recipes need to manipulate configuration to provide the same capabilities as the distributions that they're intended to replace. So if you wanted to install core just using uh, recipes and not with any kind of an install profile, here's an example of what that script would look like. But here's also an, a, a look at some of the recipes that make up what's now uh, standard as a recipe at replacing the profiles. You can see there's a lot of different recipes in there. And one of the things that's interesting is maybe you're building a site where you're not using the standard recipe, maybe you're using minimal, or maybe you're not even using anything at all, you're just sort of doing a bare install of Drupal core. You can use any of these either on their own or as part of your own custom recipe to sort of build out exactly the um, configuration architecture that you need. There's also quite a bit of work that was done on getting the Umami uh, install profile into recipes. A little bit of a different exercise because it's really meant to be a lot more opinionated in terms of the end result that it's designed to create. So 
at the end of the day, it's probably going to be uh, fewer sort of reusable pieces there, but it can also be an interesting way to see where umami has reused some of the elements from within the standard uh, recipe, but um, where sometimes it's gone off and sort of created its own elements as well. So, um, Hopefully that gives you an idea of how, you know, you can start to now use these as building blocks to sort of either um, start to build out your own site or even build your own recipes if there are particular ways that you'd like to build sites, you know, over and over again. So what are some of the things that the community is working on today in terms of this recipe system? One of the big ones is this idea of unpacking recipes. So. As we talked about in your composer file, you can require other recipes, you can have dependencies that are sort of, you know, themes or modules, and the recipes that you declare as dependencies can have their own sort of chain of dependencies as well. So composer will do a great job of bringing all of that into your website, but by nature, once you've applied a recipe, it doesn't really need to live in your code base anymore. But if you use composer to sort of remove that dependency, then all of those modules and themes that were brought in by requiring that recipe are now going to be gone from your site. The composer is basically going to take them out, and that's going to leave your site in not such a great place because it's looking for or expecting to find a bunch of like modules and themes that aren't going to be there anymore. So the, the idea of unpacking recipes is after you install, <laughs> I have to keep catching this up, after you apply a recipe, um, the, the idea of unpacking is that it would actually add those, um, those dependencies directly to sort of your site composer.json so that when you can at that point get rid of the actual recipe from your composer.json and your site will continue to, to work as expected. There's also been a lot of work around config validation. So a lot of this work is done um, it, when recipes were sort of early stage and, and um, probably more alpha, I guess you would say, you could go to apply a recipe and if there was some kind of a validation error, it might be sort of partially installed and leave your site in a state where um, it wasn't working too well because it had imported some configuration but not others and, and so it could be in basically a, a semi-broken state. So now it does a lot of validation up front to make sure that all of the configuration can be brought in uh, before it starts making changes, and then it'll basically stop and, and show you an error if there's a problem before it actually makes any changes to your site. Um, this one I would say is largely done. There's, there's been some discussion lately about potentially making some of the errors that it throws a little more verbose to sort of provide some feedback around what some of the more specific issues are. So there has also been a lot of work around making config actions a little bit more dynamic, being able to um, to move away from having to sort of specifically specify exactly where certain things should happen. So we already talked a little bit about the uh, wildcard config actions, but then there are also some config actions that are designed to sort of go across a variety of different things. So we can see here we've got instantiate on all bundles, sort of the same idea, or grant permissions for media type, and then you can provide a list and it'll sort of apply this for you. So again, making it a lot more flexible so that um, you can build out recipes that are, are going to be um, you know, more universally applicable and, and don't have to sort of be limited in terms of the, the functionality they provide. So some of the things that are part of you know, officially phase two of recipes are things like having a UI for applying recipes and recipe discovery. So both of those obviously very tightly tied to things like Project Browser. Um, there are already some recipes on Drupal.org, but understanding, you know, do we need to have a special project type for that? Is, should there be some kind of a, a way, in the same way that you can search for modules on Drupal.org, a way to sort of search and discover recipes? Some form of automated testing for recipes would definitely help in terms of as these things continue to sort of uh, get updated and changed, making sure that certain parts of them don't get broken or have regressions in the process, making sure that uh, the uh, unpacking we talked about is something that core can support, making sure that the recipe runners will always make changes or apply recipes um, sort of uh, sequentially as opposed to trying to potentially run those in parallel, 
and then also a system for potentially asking for user input before you apply a recipe. So the example, you know, we saw the location recipe earlier, the idea of potentially being, let's say, if it's going to require a Google, uh, Google Maps API key to be able to work as expected to ask the, the site builder for that so that once they apply the recipe, everything you know, works out of the box. They don't have to figure out where they need to go to put something like that in. So um, there's also been recently committed a couple of config actions that are specifically for blocks and really to make it a lot more flexible in terms of how you add blocks to your site. Because today, you can add blocks through simple configuration, but you have to explicitly provide things like, you know, what's the name of the theme? So on the back end, you can probably, you know, most people will have Claro, but that might not be their, their active admin theme. But on the front end, lots of Drupal sites, probably the vast majority of Drupal sites are using some kind of a custom theme, and so, to be able to anticipate within something like a recipe the, uh, the name of that to be able to apply blocks in there is not something that we've really been able to do until we've had these new config actions. So you can say things like place a block on the whatever the default theme happens to be. Instead of having to sort of specifically name the correct region, you can provide like a, uh, an array of different regions to say, you know, if, if you find any of these, use that. And then you can have a default region, you know, you can provide something that's going to be really uh, common, like content. And then you can also use keywords. So you can say, um, you know, put this block in the, you know, sidebar region and make it put, put it at the top, basically. And it'll do all of the work of figuring out what's the actual weight value that that block has to be used when it's imported so that it'll apply and show exactly as intended. So there's also been a, quite a bit of work in terms of providing uh, documentation, so both as an end user as well as for developers to, again, think, understand things like what are the config actions that are available and how can I use them. Unfortunately, today, those are all part of um, the GitLab repo for the uh, recipes project. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of getting those moved into the main Drupal.org documentation. And for anybody in the audience who's feeling really inspired and wants to help out, um, this would be a great place to start by helping out with getting that documentation moved. There is also a link for the uh, recipes cookbook, which is kind of a directory of existing recipes. So you can go to here, there's a QR code. It's also linked in the slides. And it's a great place to go to sort of understand what are some of the things that you can use on your site already today to help you with site building. So there's a few things in there. I think uh, some of the canopy ones are more about like getting a, the admin experience of your site set up. Um, but there's uh, a couple in there that we're going to see uh, in a few minutes that are really around sort of providing specific sets of capabilities. And actually, that's where we're going to go right now. Uh, hopefully, I can get this mic stand to work. Can I do this one? So let's go into our demo, which is this fresh install of Drupal that we have. So we go up here and go to add content. We can see that we only have the article and basic page. So this is a fairly fresh install of Drupal. Um, we can talk later if anybody wants to get into it about exactly what's been added on top of a basic install, but um, for all intents and purposes, this is a fresh install. So we're going to go ahead and go oh, ddev drush recipe and go ahead and install our events recipe. So you can see, you could probably see how very quickly it ran that it was installing a variety of modules and importing some configuration. Oh, one other thing. Current state of recipes, it's usually a good idea to rebuild your cache after you're done. And now if we go back to our site, you can see if we go in here, now we have the ability to add an event, and there's also a main navigation item for events. If we go in here, we've got tabs for both upcoming as well as past events. And for content authors, there's a nice obvious button in terms of how you go ahead and add a new event. So we can go ahead, 
just drop in something for next week. Go ahead and save that. And now we can see that it's listed within our events listing. And if we click in to view the detail page, it's also got our add calendar links. That's out of the box showing us you know, links to integrate with Google Calendar, Outlook, and um, you know, iOS as well. So uh, lots of capability that was you know, really just like a couple of seconds of effort in terms of adding those. Um, but maybe we want to do some extra things in terms of, again, starting to build out more of the site architecture. So if we go back to our command line, let's go back and let's say this time we want to add um, alerts. And now if we clear our cache, refresh the page. You can see now we have this tab at the top of our site that says to add an alert. So if we go in here and we say, uh, GoCon is awesome. I want to make sure the whole world knows when they come to our site. So now when we go in here, we can see we've got this banner. Um, this will display site-wide. It uses a JavaScript that will put something to local storage if people are like, yeah, I know it's awesome. I don't need to, to view the detail. And only for that user, it will be dismissed. And notice as well, if you go to a particular alert, um, it hides the banner for that alert because if you're already on that page, you don't need to... You already know that, that GovCon is awesome in this example. So uh, having this kind of site-wide alert, again, is something that you can apply in a couple of seconds. Um, I think is kind of fun. And then we'll do one more example here in terms of, in this case, having quick links. Here we go. So a variety of different Projects have been installed there. And now if we go back to our site, actually this time we're going to need to navigate back to the home page to see it. We've got this ability to add links to our home page. So we could say, let's go ahead here, grab and so we've got the TV icon, let's just call this videos, these are all texts, you should do better than that, but this is a demo, so I play fast and loose, and then we can say the link that we wanted to show, let's call this videos with a capital V, uh, we can specify where it should link, and it will use an autocomplete, but in this case we're just going to feed it something false and call it video. And if we go ahead and save that. Now it's, it's use that SVG file to make these uh, links. We can go ahead and add another one. Let's go ahead and file PDF. That's fine. Just say PDF icon. Go ahead and save that. Insert that and say files and give it a give it a fake link here and then go and so you can see you can sort of quickly build out that sort of like landing page navigation that helps to direct people to the most common tasks on your site um, it's using svgs and it's using current colors so you can use css to sort of control the colors that these things are going to appear in very easily and then it also has driver reviews integration. Uh, all of this, again, directly on the page, so your content author doesn't have to like remember some place that's like deep within your site. Um, admin navigation to go and go and make these changes. But you know, yeah, go ahead and drag and drop, save that, and now you've you've reordered those. So it becomes a very flexible and easy to use way to manage those. It's also using the um, responsive grid uh, view display that was new in Drupal 10. So it'll work really nicely on mobile devices and, and those kinds of things as well. So that's just a little taste of some of the things that you can uh, do using recipes on your site. But if anybody wants to see even more, tomorrow I'm going to um, be doing another talk called Stupendous Day Tricks, where I go through some of the extra things that you can do using recipes. Um, 
particularly around events and then also going into some of the sort of like deeper configuration and ways you can uh, very quickly model some, you know, even fairly complex uh, functionality around managing dates and times in Drupal. So that's going to be in this room again tomorrow at 11 a.m. So if anybody is one to uh, sort of jump in and get started helping, we did already talk about uh, documentation as a place where help is definitely needed. Um, also, anybody who wants to help either developing or testing some existing recipes or even helping to get that system of test coverage, all of those would be incredibly helpful. Um, people who want to sort of add to that library of available recipes, uh, that's also going to be really helpful. There is a recipes channel in Drupal Slack that folks can join and every other Tuesday at, uh, well, 1600 UTC, um, you can go ahead and uh, be in there, be part of the, the discussions that happen sort of asynchronously within that Slack channel. And then there are also going to be uh, contrib events at things like DrupalCon, so um, that's also a really excellent way to sort of um, be part of the community effort on this. So uh, there is also within the Drupal CMS project this meta issue about all of the different tracks. So um, you'll notice that a lot of these are around either helping to uh, build out recipes that are already reasonably well-defined, maybe helping to uh, create definition around what some of these recipes should do, or some of these are even just proposals around like, is this a recipe that we should build? So there's lots of ways to contribute based on you know, what your passion is in terms of being involved in these things. I also wanted to give a, a shout out to some of the, the folks that have really been instrumental in building out the recipe system. So, you know, we mentioned Alex Pot, but also Wynn Lears, Fenna Proxima, Jim Birch, and really a whole host of other people that have done a ton of work. I even see a few people in the crowd here that I know have been helpful. So, uh, thanks to all of you who have been part of this effort. And really, uh, that's it. So, in terms of recipes, you know, there's, there's lots of great things that you can do already, uh, but certainly more to come as well. And the last thing I'll mention, by the way, this is the QR code if you want to access the slides. Uh, that's up on SlideShare, and I do also have some smart data stickers with me for anybody who wants them. So, uh, with that, I will open it up for any questions. Didn't you all, it sounds like you're asking about the recipes version specific. Uh, so, I feel like most of what's in the recipe system today should work for both Drupal 10.3 and Drupal 11. There may be some subtle things that work better in 11 than 10.3, but I feel like certainly for the remaining life of like 10.3 and 10.4, we'll probably see there should be fairly good parity there. Um, certainly until then, Drupal 11.1 where you may start to see um, you know, more innovations that are happening on the Drupal level side of things. Any other questions? Yes. Are there any plans to have some kind of like recipes log on a Drupal site where if, if, you, if you inherit a site or something like that, you can see what previous recipes were installed? So the question is whether there's a plan to have a recipes log so that if you inherit a site, you can see what recipes have been applied. So there's, there's sort of two answers. Uh, the first is that by design, recipes do not leave a trace um, in site that they're applied to. That being said, what I've heard is that there's an intent for the project browser to keep track of that so they can do things like recommend recipes that could extend something that you have applied. So not meant to act as kind of an audit log, but more as a way to sort of recommend things that are more likely to be helpful. Any other questions? Yes. What's the process for like for creating the new recipe? So the question was, what's the process for creating a new recipe? Um, I would say today there's no sort of simple way. I know Kevin Cullen had worked on some kind of a like a I can't remember if it was like a drush extension, something like that, to help uh, generate recipes. There is an issue open on the features module to potentially allow some uh, let's say a new version of features to actually be able to generate recipes, but today I would say it's largely a manual process. Now that being said, the actual configuration, if you do like a Drush CDX export your configuration, 
that's going to give you the configuration, you know, files that you need. And then, you know, through some trial and error at this point, you can sort of figure out which things would be better as config actions versus, you know, just providing those S3 files. I would say, particularly if you're, if you're taking that kind of granular approach, oftentimes it's not a lot of work to create a recipe that way, but um, there is a little bit of sort of trial and error, at least today, I would say, in terms of creating those. Um, oh, yeah, it's the one. How, how would you go about debugging those? So the question is, how would you go about debugging a recipe? That's a great question. Um, so the, the honest answer is, it will depend on the kind of error that you get. Um, I've recently run into a couple of errors that were really problems not as much with the recipe as with some of the code that's still officially experimental that's in core. So sometimes it's, it's not always straightforward. If, if, if it's just a case of a recipe saying, so one of the common things that I've run into at the early stage of, of working on a recipe is that it'll say something like, um, so again, going back to that idea of item potency, it'll say, oh, well this particular piece of configuration already exists in the site and is different from what's provided. So that's a, a, a clue basically that you need to now use a config action using something like the creative, if not exist, to say, you know, provide it if it's not there already, but if it is there already, let's just go with what you have already. So. Depending on the type of error, there's, there's maybe a, different, a couple of different things that could be the cause. Um, and then, you know, as, as we talked about before, sometimes it's as simple as clearing the hash after you've applied a recipe may actually fix your problem. So, yeah, I'm sorry I don't have more third answer on that. I think there's a question over here. Could you say more about, you said the design decision to have them not be the trace or not in the trail? Um, I wish Alex Pop was here, because he, I'm sure he could give a better answer on that than I am. Uh, I'm gonna be able to, but um, I think the, the idea of recipe is it's, it's really just meant to be sort of almost like a deployment mechanism for configuration. So it's really not meant to be something that, um, you know, is becomes in some way part of the history of the site, if you know what I mean. It's like, it's really just meant to, to sort of say, well, let's add, this things and, and really in a way almost be like um, an accelerated that you know somebody who knew what they were doing could go around and do all of the same things through the UI by you know building out of you or you know creating a content type all of those things but just doing it so that somebody who's new to Drupal or maybe somebody who just wants to build a, a Drupal website really fast can use recipes to do that you know instead of, of the manual way. Yes. Maybe you know is that there are some plans to, to track popularity of recipes. We can see how many usages of modules. So the question is, is there plans to track the popularity of, of recipes? I would say definitely yes, because there's an idea in the Project Browser that when you go in, it will sort of recommend the recipes that are most popular. Um, I have to imagine that that's intended to be through a project browser that the, the tracking will happen, but I don't, I would, to be honest, have a lot of technical detail in terms of how they, they plan to do that tracking at this stage. Yes? Are the current recipes 508 compliant? Are the current recipes 508 compliant? 508 compliant. So I, I apologize, I'm from Canada, so we use some, some different terminology there, but I'm pretty sure it's a question about accessibility. So I would say at this point, there probably hasn't been a lot of work done necessarily on that. I mean, certainly if you look at something like the ones that the Canopy team has done around like spinning up your um, you know, admin experience on a new site, I have to imagine that a lot of the sites that they build are 501, 501 compliant, so I would, I would assume that there's, they're not too, too terrible, but to the extent that you know, recipes may bring in and configure certain, let's say, you know, in the case of the events one that we saw, uh, the Smart Date widget, you know, I know there's been testing on, on that particular module for accessibility, but whether, you know, it can be sort of certified as 508 compliant, you know, there, there's probably gonna have to be some, some trial and error. So to the extent that there are recipes that are gonna be part of, you know, Starshot slash Drupal CMS, you know, as um, 
Mike talked about this morning, there's a team that's already planning to sort of provide accessibility feedback to that effort. So certainly ones that are directly included in ACWI CMS, I would say will be 508 compliant. I'm not sure if that'll be MVP or you know there may be some some sort of you know trailing things that need to be cleaned up, but but those ones I would say will be. Some of the other ones, it'll it'll really depend on sort of you know the projects that they're based on. Yeah. Yes. What about like conditional config actions where depending on if the site was originally built like on minimal profile or standard profile, there's gonna be different configurations that exist there. Is there a way to say, okay, so this was built on minimal, therefore apply this configuration conditionally, or if it was built on standard to a different so the question was, if is there any ability to do a config action that will sort of conditionally apply, per, perhaps you know one set of configuration versus another based on what was originally you know installed via something like the you know standard or minimal recipes in core? Uh, so the simple answer is no. Um, by design, recipes are not supposed to make decisions. There's not really meant to be sort of conditional logic. Um, I would say the closest thing to that is sort of that idea of the like create if not exists. So you can say if there is something that is in standard that's a dependency for something you want to do, you can provide that and say, you know, oh, if somebody's used something else and it's not there, here's the thing to use. But if it wasn't standard, it'll just sort of it'll see that it's there and skip over it. So that's like as close as you can get to to that idea, but you couldn't say like use completely different configuration you know, one or the other based on, you know, the, the existing state when you apply the recipe. Right, so uh, with, like, minimal, you would have no configuration that would exist there. Right. And with standard, you would have configuration that you might need to override. That's the part, like, it does have a, it does have a value, but I want to change that value that comes to fall out of standard. There's, there's probably ways to do that. Um, you can do things like, um, you know, set certain values explicitly. That that may be a way, a path to do that. You might need to do something like create if not if not exists, and then later on do something that specifically changes it in the ways that you want to make sure that it ends up as that end state. But yeah, yes. What, what about if your recipe includes some module or whatever that has either like a, 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 an alternative module or whatever that that they can they're not recommended to use it together or any checks. You know, kind of like the core search and search API, they at least give you an alert saying, hey, you got both of the skull. And I think, like, so one of your, your I think one of the other uh, examples you gave was it had uh, it had uh, leaflet as a map module and then there's like geolocation. And you had geolocation already installed and you were installing a recipe that required a leaflet. But then, would you know? So the question was, is there anything in the recipe system to handle almost like contraindications? So say like if you've got something on your site that isn't going to play well with something that the recipe is going to add, is there something to sort of anticipate that and warn you that you shouldn't basically apply the recipe? I would say today there's nothing that I know of, but I, I can see where there, there would be value in that and maybe that would be something good to open up as an issue on the you know, recipes and distributions project. I have similar, like, if there's, because I don't see, like, version requirements or constraints, so if there's, like, backwards incompatible models, maybe uh, a newer version of the module exists, but the rest of uses older config, so that older version of uh, the module, how, how does that, do they don't do something like set, or create not exist? So the question was, is there anything around sort of version constraints, for example, if a recipe requires an older version of a module to make sure that it uses the version that's compatible based on the configuration it's bringing. So uh, fair. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say really it's Composer that is it probably how you're going to handle that, right? Because in Composer, within the recipe, it can basically specify exactly which versions it's compatible with, and that's probably at least today I think your best bet for for being yeah. specific. Like that. A non-developer might want to start a job. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess so, so the question, the follow-up question was, um, a non-developer, how would they go about doing that? I'm not sure at this point, non-developers are probably making recipes. Um, 
But in terms of applying recipes, the, the composer version constraints should be able, be able to prevent them from applying a recipe that isn't compatible based on, let's say, a version of a, of a module that's newer than, than what the recipe scores. Any other questions? Oh, someone? Uh, the, uh, my assumption is that once it's applied, then you export the config and deploy that as you would do through your uh, time cycle. So the question was, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. question. Then after you've applied a recipe, um, you can basically uninstall, or I guess remove the recipe. Uh, just how do you get the config up from your local environment to throughout the time? Okay, so the, the question was, once you apply a recipe, how do you get the configuration from your local up to, let's say, you know, your staging or your production server? So once you apply the recipe, it really becomes part of your site configuration. And so then when you do your, your standard like configuration export, that will now be part of that you know, set of configuration YAML um, files that you're probably already you know, version tracking. And then you're going to put that in your merge request. And, get that reviewed and deployed between environments and, and how to do all of those things. So it's really the same as if you had done all of the same changes by hand. Yes. Yes? Is the recipe itself interviewed? Like, the existence of the recipe in the basis is that way? Like, So I think the question was, is, is there any, um, is there anything in the, the site configuration or just, I guess, general code of the site to sort of indicate that the recipe was used? And the answer is really no. I mean, if the recipe is still, is part of your code base and it's still there, then you'll be able to see that. But technically, as somebody who, you know, to the earlier example, inherited the site, I can see that the recipe is there, but I won't necessarily know if it was actually applied or not. Yes. Sorry to follow up on that again. <laughs> so can recipes be removed? So recipes can be removed, but the, the challenge is that unpacking idea that we talked about before. So you can remove the recipe, the configuration will still be in your site, but if you actually like composer remove the recipe, then all of the dependencies that were brought in by that recipe are no longer there. And so you so if a recipe requires six modules, right. and you had two of those modules already installed before you installed the recipe, and somebody's trying out a recipe, and they say, oh, I don't want it, and then they remove the recipe, it's going gonna, it's gonna to also just remove those two modules that were previous. Okay, so the question was, um, if you, let's say a recipe calls for six modules, two of them you already had installed on your site, um, you try it out, you decide you don't want it, and then you compose or remove the recipe, is it going to remove those two files that you had previously? Because you had Composer required them previously, they would still be in your Composer.json as requirements. So removing the recipe shouldn't remove them from the code base. It would still be there in your Composer.json. So you can have overlapping requirements in your Composer file, like today. And recipes doesn't change that. Yes? If I wanted to make a new config action, I would have to so the question was, if you wanted to create a new config action, would that have to be a core contribution? It would be if you wanted it to be something that everyone can use, but technically you could, because it's, it's essentially a class, you could put that into a contrib module, you could put that into a custom module that only exists on your site, if you don't think that it's going to be useful to anything outside your particular site. So I could ship a module with So the question was, could you ship a recipe that includes its own config action? Is that right? Uh, well, or like a custom module that would define config action and come with the recipe that would only work as that module. So what you could do is put your config action into a custom module and then have a recipe that requires that, installs that first, and then does a config action based on it. Yeah. All right, I think I'm well over my time here, so. Um, <laughs> like